Hi, Misha here, and let's do another one of these black boxes. It's been a little bit since I posted one, but to be fair, you got two in one week last time. Kind of did that because I knew I'd be a little busy this past week, and uh, yeah, I was the week before in this one, but um, all's well, except for the blooming goddamn motherfucking weather will not cool off. It's still in the 80s here, upper 70s at the very least, in October. God, it just, you know, I don't mind hot weather in the summer, but I, I like weather to be proper. Winter cold, summer hot, autumn and spring, nice weather. But when autumn doesn't really come like it should, it particularly bugs me because it's my favorite time of year, September through October especially in the November somewhat, but really September, October. And I feel like for quite some time now, we haven't really had those seasons and oh, I still miss it. Anyway, was uh, out of town for a few days <clears throat> and then catching up on work and what have you. So a few things first. Earlier in the year, I said that one of the main goals of buying the guns from Sand Imports, JDI, Dave there, the Swiss SIGs, was to go on and pay off our house. And we've been chipping away at it throughout the year and made our final payment. Oh, about two weeks ago? Yeah, about two weeks ago. Week and a half, maybe. So that is done. Which is an interesting feeling. Probably the first time in my adult life haven't had either rent or a mortgage to worry about paying. The funny thing is, we actually would like to get a bigger place. Not substantially bigger, but you know, a little bit bigger. And more out of town. And that would be kind of our permanent home from now on. Told the wife, and she agrees, that I've got one more move left in me, perhaps. But now that we paid this place off, I found myself rather reluctant to get back into that. So we'll see. And kind of hand in hand with that is the future of things. I really am uh, I'm very uncertain the uh, the gun market I don't know where we're going uh, the, the the government there are, there are several proposals for new rules and regulations new ideas of course very little of the proposals actually go through but they, they've been yammering a lot and we have had some things happen like the sanctions on Russian ammo but even more than that, the 2020 buying craze did something funky to the market. Now, you'd think dealers and distributors profited very well and did well, and they did. But this year, I, I especially now as things are slowing down, people get used to those big paychecks. And so, as I've said in previous videos, several distributors... Even several dealers have uh, gone out of business or on hard times. And I kind of sell niche firearms. Interesting mill syrup guns, higher end imports. For example, I had a, a, a brother of a, of a good friend call me today asking for a, a Glock 43 for his wife. I would love to help him, but that's just not what I sell. Why? Because there's no market in those. And every gun shop sells those. So I just, for what I have to lay out, it's not worth it to me. And I personally don't do drop ship. Um, some companies do, and that's fine. But I like to be able to handle the product myself, know that what I send the customer is right, inspect it. I just, I feel better about that. Just personal taste. But a lot of the online vendors that do Glocks and really a lot of handguns, things like that, they drop ship. Usually direct from the manufacturer, so things are probably great. 
but the money's so small and it's just not worth it worth it for me the problem is the niche items that i'm into well the new production imports those are very much under under threat or in danger of being either prohibited from importation or new regs coming through that really limit what can come in that's that's no good and uh milsurp I love Milserp. Sometimes I wish all I could do was just buy collections, you know, go across the country, kind of like, uh, you know, American Pickers, but strictly speaking, guns. And I've done that. I've bought, I don't know, 20 or 30 collections, some of them small, just 16 guns, some of them 100 guns or more. And I love doing that. It's always a, an experience. But you can't count on those. They, they come when they come. And of course, you need a lot of ready cash to hand which is not always the easiest thing to do in business of course you can liquidate assets but that takes time so the mill serps is good that's actually where i very first got started with those are bare arms back when i started the company in 2009 mill serp was still quite available not as much as it had been maybe a decade previous but still yeah that's where i got started i only moved into newer guns as the mill syrup started to dry up and also as i started to make contacts in the gun business but i can't really count on that there's not much mill syrup coming in makes me sad what can you do and what is coming in is either of pretty low quality or already gets scarfed up by companies uh for example the mosin crate which I really like the owner of. We know each other pretty well. And he kind of already has an in with Century for anything decent they have coming. And I used to have a good in with Century, but and it, it kind of made me sad because I had a good relationship with them for about 10 years. But then they kind of changed their business practice and how they, uh, how they wanted to do things, yada, yada. It all just changes. I don't know, guys. I don't know beyond that now i still do ak's i'm still stocking arsenals just got some sam fives in sam seven r's sam seven k's but that's a pretty small thing to to hang your hat on i i don't know zastavas i really like them but they don't sell particularly great online i think because so many gun shops stock them i don't really have a good connection for their stuff and the margins are a little skinny on those Zestava guns. Wassers, again, because I don't have a good connection with Century. To be honest, though, right now, I wouldn't really get into Wassers too much because they're not really worth the money they're asking, in my opinion, even though I'm right. Of course, I still am doing the WBP and FB Radom guns. Those do well for me, but... The supply is pretty limited, kind of like with the Arsenals. It's not a lot to hang your uh, hang your hat on. The Markle Mar set me's have been good to me, but I don't know how much longer that will last too. And you know, usually when one door closes, another one opens. But right now, I'm having a hard time seeing a new door to open because most makers of military type guns overseas are already exporting here. Of course, you have MKE, Mekek, out of Turkey, IWI, out of Israel, D-Technic, and CZ, out of the Czech Republic. You know, you get what I'm saying. The ones that we're not getting, like Russia and China and North Korea, for that matter, are sanctioned. I don't know. Um, you know, I could just be, yeah, I could be completely wrong. In a month, the besterest opportunity ever could pop up. The Swiss guns obviously did me very well, but that's a niche thing. Those are directly in the sights of um, of p potential new regulations that the ATF might do for imports. And I can say that Dave is, um, let's say, concerned about the future and also making auxiliary plans in case things get shut down. So if he goes... That's probably my number one major source. And I also, one of the things I got started with even before my FFL was approved while I was waiting, parts kits. I used to make a lot of money and have a lot of fun buying and sorting through parts kits. But because of the barrel ban and other stuff, those have become more and more expensive and lesser and lesser quality. 
and there just have not been very many parts kits to to deal with and speaking of from time to time i'll post one of the uh, guns that mark has built for me from a kit uh, originally it was mk gun mods when he was down in uh, mount dora florida and now that his business is in dallas georgia he's uh, mac arms which is basically his name initials and he moved to georgia because a he was able to kind of buy part of a mountainside and have property and b be close to his daughter which is you know a very nice thing to do when you're uh, getting into your 70s so cool on him but because part good quality parts kits are drying up and because he's aging he's in his 70s now i don't think it'll be a whole lot longer that he is uh, doing builds and that'll be a sad day for me because he's built a lot of guns for me i met him ran into him about 12 years ago really through happenstance and he's built some really cool guns in fact i was just packing up a beretta mab 38a which is the nine mil submachine gun they had early in world war ii for a customer and i hope you, the customer really likes it because mark did one for me years ago and i love the damn thing he also did me a 3842 pistol, which is cool beans as well. In fact, that gun wasn't necessarily built from a kit. It was actually built from a DWAT a friend's father brought back from World War II. But as my friend aged out of that and was kind of selling off his collection in anticipation of moving to a smaller house or apartment, he had to let that go. And so, yeah. I, pretty cool and it's no longer a dewatt it is a working Samato, and uh, really like the beretta guns i love to get a pm 12 but uh, all in all I, I feel pretty fortunate to have run into mark he's done a lot of my favorite guns my mat 49 for example um one i wish i could find a parts get up before it's just too late is a a japanese type 100 submachine gun i know fat chance but hey i've got a few dreams left and that would be one of them I would jump on in a heartbeat to get him to do a conversion. Or I might even just leave it as a D-Watt. Because let's be honest, 8 mil Nambu, you're probably not going to be getting a bunch of to shoot through a sub gun. But the rest he's done for me are, are functional Tomatoes. But little sources like him, I don't know how much longer I can count on. Old manufacturers like Vector are gone. I used to do a lot of Vector stuff. I used to do a lot with Remington and Mossberg, but that was via Lou Horton. Uh, I used to do a lot with Smith & Wesson uh, revolvers, but those, those, those are kind of all gone now. Uh, I don't know. And, you know, I might still find the new source here and there. Again, the Marco Mars are a pretty new thing that I've started carrying the last couple of years. But usually for every one new thing I pick up, I kind of lose two or three old sources. So over the years, just my access to stuff has has dwindled and it's not like there's stuff out there i want to get for the store and can't it's just in a weird way the market has shrunk because of the lack of surplus the 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 lesser availability of kits yeah you can get ars galore glocks galore and that's great but that's just not what i've uh, kind of based my business on so with all of that said yeah i'm just not sure which is why i was happy to get this house taken care of and while i may be a little reluctant right now to jump into another mortgage but that could change so um other stuff going on we uh we lost a cat a couple of weeks ago um, he was outdoors enjoying the nice weather and a big dog came down the street really don't know who it belongs to and essentially ate him um it's about as gruesome as you can imagine. But at least he didn't linger. It wasn't like he was crawling. And, I mean, it seems to have been pretty instant, which is, if it's going to go, it, it's better that way. Years ago, I had a very good cat, <laughs> ironically named Koshka. I picked up at the shelter. And because she was a shelter cat, I just never, I could get her to stay indoors, but she just never would stay indoors permanently. She just had to get outside and do her cat things, even though it wasn't my favorite we had her for a couple of years, very good cat, but um, she got hit by a car, kind of mashed her hindquarters, and unfortunately it didn't kill her, 
She'd been missing for a couple of days, and then I heard her meowing. I was sitting out in the back, kind of like I am right now at night, and I heard her meowing, and I knew her meowing. And I thought, oh, okay, she came back. Well, I quickly discovered she came back, but not in a good way. And she basically, she came back for me to help her to make the pain go away, and it totally just, her rear was completely, anyway. Plus, I was a college student, and even if a vet could have fixed her, which was very doubtful, I couldn't have afforded it. I hate, I hate that. I really do. But I, I couldn't afford several thousand dollars to fix her. I, I was doing good to feed me, her, and the dog. So um, all I could do was was uh, put her out of her suffering, and that was uh, pretty pretty damn rough. Pretty damn rough. But uh, yeah, so at least this was quick, and that happens. I mean, he wasn't a young cat at all. He was uh, 12, 13, so pretty good life. But still, kind of makes me mad. Whoever's dog was running stray down the road. It was definitely on our property too, which is aggravating. Um, let's see, what else? Um, not to give away much private information, but my wife's uh, job search for fruit, she was offered a job uh, about a week and a half ago and accepted it, so she'll be starting a new career, at least hopefully career, certainly a new job, hopefully career. Uh, in, a, in a local company quite soon. It was kind of our second choice. She applied to eight or ten different companies and at least made it to the face-to-face -face interview stage with them. The number one place I think we both wanted to get a, a job at was our local bank uh, for various reasons. This place was our number two choice, so not bad. Uh, quite nicely, though, they actually gave her the salary, the wage she asked for. And the hours are actually 40 hours a week. And if you work over 40 hours, amazingly, you get paid. That's something I've noticed with a lot of these corporations. They'll offer you a really attractive salary, upper five digits, even six digits. But then you realize you're working 50, 60, even 80 hours in some instances during peak season a week. Still not a bad wage, but, you know... If you're working 80 hours and making, say, 100000 that's really only 50000 And you're not getting paid time and a half or whatever. So you kind of have to work, look at the hours they work you. Something that people on salary don't, I think, always consider. Plus, a lot of these companies, they want you to be on call, or beckon call, really, 24-7. Answering your phone, answering your email. You know, there's no... Like, oh, it's after 5 or after 6, I'm, I'm off the clock. It's like, nope, if we email you at 9 p.m., you better answer. Um, if we need you here on Saturday, you better come in. Which just slaughters your social life, your family life, everything. And I'm not talking about being a doctor. There's, there's certain professions like that where, yeah, you, you kind of need to be on call because people's lives are at risk. But I'm sorry, a corporation... You, it's not that critical. I'm sorry. Um, if they do or don't make an extra half a million because you show up at work, hell, it's not like you see any of that money in your pocket. You don't get a bonus or a raise if you do it. You might get an attaboy or a dinky trophy. But, um, yeah, I have a pretty iffy <laughs> attitude towards jumbo corporations, which is funny because I'm actually very purely uh, pro-capitalist, but I'm kind of more small business capitalism, if that makes sense, or at least old school capitalism, where the owners, if they didn't know all their employees' names, at least knew how many employees they had. <laughs> yeah, and they knew what they were doing. They, they knew the factory floors and stuff. But uh, yeah, it's a different world, isn't it, nowadays? And uh, it's not all bad, to be sure, but it's definitely a different world. But yeah, she'll be starting a new job so that's she's gonna have a very interesting schedule that's gonna force some changes in our lives but we'll make it happen because uh, it was time for her to leave her current position again because of how corporations essentially treat their employees and you know they complain about lack of worker loyalty employee loyalty but you know you gotta give it to to receive it and they don't give it at all 
they, they want and want and want, but then they don't want to put out. <laughs> Sounds like a really, really bad marriage, but that's kind of what it is. Completely with being paid, so a, a prostitution marriage? I don't know, it's late at night. Whores. So I've kind of got a fun little topic, thought experiment for the end of the video. But first, uh, model news. Got to talk about models since it's this channel. I have been posting quite a few uh, model videos, although this, although this week I had to be kind of uh, lax on the personal channel videos because uh, working on main Mishiko channel videos. Got about half a dozen in the can, just need editing and polishing and all that. So, you know, enough for the next couple of weeks. Anyway, models. Uh, finally, I got a ship notice from Eagle Moss of the Osiris from Battlestar Galactica. Cool beans. I'm uh, really looking forward to that one. And uh, that's all from them. I'm kind of wondering because I've had a lot of pre-orders. I'm hoping to get some more more notices pretty soon. I guess we'll uh, we'll find out. But uh, not really a whole lot new from Hobby Master. Nothing from Corgi. Surprise, surprise. So I have kind of decided to get into something else a little bit. Tanks, because I was bored, and they are actually inexpensive, and Aikens was doing a weekend sale, and they forgot to update some of their old prices on tanks, so I noticed after I placed my order, they went back and updated the prices, and, and it raised them 5 or $10 a model, because they had some actual decent quality ones for like 9 bucks. So after the discount, it was like 8 bucks, 7 bucks. why not? Uh, but I started off with Russian, because that's mainly my main thing. I thought about getting a little bit of this, a little bit of that, but I thought, you know what, I'd rather just focus on kind of one nation, Russia. I may uh, do American later. I don't know if I'm going to get into German, though. That's a whole other uh, thing, and I, I don't want to get too deep into this. Uh, not being able to drive myself, my uh, ability to understand... It's kind of weird. I, I understand aircraft better than I understand vehicles, armor. Yeah, I don't know. But anyway, I don't know, something new. And I thought that there can be some fun video topics from uh, that. Um, I guess that's about it on models. Been relatively quiet on that front. I did get a new Japanese uh, fighter jet, which is cool. It's the, uh, it's their version, the J8M. It's their version of the ME 163 Comet. So that is cool. Um, looks a lot like the Comet, but it's Japanese, and I like picking up any kind of Japanese plane I can get uh, get my hands on because why not? I would probably pick up Japanese tanks too because there's actually quite a few of them available. So one final thought, kind of a thing before we end this black box to try to have a topic, not just personal updates. What do you think about the internet? Uh, how it's changed, evolved, perhaps devolved, and how your use of it has changed, evolved, or devolved. Now, I'm of an age where I was on the internet pretty early on. In fact, the main limiting factor was my location being in rural Arkansas, because with dial-up, it was long distance. So that was kind of what stopped me until I had my own money and whatnot. And first got on the interwebs about 1992, give or take. And but then around 1995, my small town actually got a local internet service provider and it was on from there. And uh, boy, the early days of the internet, they were uh, something. Porn, of course a lot of video game sites. Wikipedia didn't exist yet. YouTube couldn't exist because back then we were doing good to, to upload photos or maybe GIFs. I mean, uh, first modem, I, I didn't have a 300 baud. I did have a 2400 early on and then 96. And then when I got to a 14.4, that was smoking, I, I thought. And it was, it was the first time you could actually download something there was at least several megabytes. Before that, you were pretty much limited to kilobytes. And, um, you know, I went to websites, email, that kind of stuff. Of course, it wasn't what it was today. 
one of the first messengers, I guess it was the first messenger I installed, was ICQ, which is an Israeli program that probably a lot of younger people have never heard of. And I did that because of uh, my cousins wanted me to get it. But what was neat back then, it was a global program. So you just, you know, you had a number, you logged on, you had a, you know, a handle, a name, uh, and it was private chat. You could do some group chat stuff. It was mostly one-on-one -on -one chat boxes and, and messaging. And back then, it was just such a thrill to be online. And what was even cooler to me was you would meet people across the USA and across the world. I mean, that's the first time I probably talked one-on-one -on -one with a lot of people from a lot of nations that I'd never encountered before, aside from maybe a foreign exchange student or, you know, an immigrant here. But just to talk to them when they were going about their day-to-day -day lives was uh, quite fascinating and, and fun. And back then, everyone used usernames. And there was, <laughs> despite what you hear and stuff, people were very cautious about their information, their private information. That, that was something you just didn't give out. People are a lot more cavalier about it today. Back then, you had each of those usernames. And if you were on reasonably good terms, you would give someone your first name. You very rarely gave them your last name. And if you like someone enough, trust them enough, you might send them a picture or two of yourself, usually clothed. The big one was uh, phone numbers, that kind of data. That was rarely shared back then because just, you just didn't do it frequently. In fact, I remember the first time I met someone who met someone on the Internet. It was a girl we went to school with, and uh, she had a beau that she met. And he came down from Massachusetts, and it was interesting. Um, trust me, it didn't go probably the way you think it did. Uh, someone uh, ended up getting beat up, but it's not who you think. And anyway, we'll leave it there, because again, privacy. You know, by the late 90s, that's when I would go to college and get a T1 connection. And this is when you could, this is a couple of years after Napster. I remember Napster came around. The first time I installed it would have been 98, give or take. And at that point, you could download music. That was awesome. Videos were still a ways off. I think one of the first videos I recall downloading was Troops, the Star Wars parody of Cops. Of course, it was quick time and probably god-awful resolution. Uh, maybe. I don't really know. <laughs> but, um, yeah, into the 2000s. And then things do start to kind of get more commercial. You start to see more and more selling online. PayPal comes online about 2000. eBay starts to get big. I think it came out a year or so earlier, but first time I got on eBay and PayPal was around 2000. And uh, YouTube still a ways off. Wikipedia still a ways off. Google, very young at this time. And there's a lot of forums used. I, I did something awful, maybe a little 4chan back in the day. Forms were kind of the big interaction then. And then uh, things kind of progress. Uh, so everyone starts getting fast connections. Modems really fall out of vogue in the early 2000s. Everyone starts to have something better than dial-up. And this, of course, leads to Wikipedia and then eventually YouTube in 2005-ish. Although it would probably be a couple of years before I bumped into it. And this is when the internet really starts to get more regulated and commercial. You know, there was the whole Napster conspiracy. And um, at first, you know, Facebook was for college students. In fact, you had to have a .edu a email to get on there. But of course, once that got opened up to um, the world, fewer college students, a lot more soccer moms. And uh, kind of blew up from there. And originally, YouTube had no advertising, no monetizing. And then we got Amazon. You know, it came in, and then it grew. And then, you know, Netflix. That, I think the first time I messed around with Netflix wasn't all that long ago. I wasn't an early user of Netflix. So, oh, maybe picked it up 11, 12 years ago, something like that. But... Uh, yeah. It's amazing how much it's changed. Some ways for the good. I mean, there's a lot more on the internet now. But it also is a little more insular. 
I don't think people talk to people from foreign nations just at random for no particular reason like we used to do. If you talk to someone now, they're usually your Facebook friend or, or something. Uh, you might do a live chat, a live stream, and visit with someone from a foreign country. But back then it was so random and just apropos of nothing, which was really part of its joy. <laughs> But of course, it's also become a lot more censored. YouTube became monetized, which invited corporations in. Yes, the same corporations I love oh so much. Amazon became a behemoth. Uh, the or, the earlier uh, web things that were early, you know, frankly, Netscape and Magellan and even AOL. That that stuff kind of trailed away. Google became king. And then these websites, if they're successful, get bought out or integrated. And Facebook is... Uh, honestly, guys, I think Facebook is gross. I, I've never had it. But I think part of it was I did my days with ICQ back back when, starting in the mid-90s. So by the time Facebook came around, I was kind of done with it. Plus, what I never liked about Facebook, you did really have private conversations. If you posted or tagged or did something to someone everyone could potentially see it and i've always just been a private person what i tell one person may not be for everyone to to witness and i may not want everyone to know who my friends are oh by the way myspace yeah i dabbled on that for a minute not much though uh, yeah but that was a thing for a minute i, heard, I think i heard it recently it's still technically around which is sad it's funny when you go back to these old websites that are still somehow going, but not really anything. <laughs> Cracked.com comes to mind. Uh, the Onion. <laughs> oh, yeah. A lot of old band websites I used to go to a lot are either defunct or just sad. And everything has become kind of more centralized. Facebook, YouTube... Instagram, Twitter, Twatter, TikToker. Um, it is more social media now. But I still love Wikipedia. I still love reading random articles and going down those rabbit holes. That to me is a lot of fun. And um, there's, there's plenty of informational sites out there if you want to choose to do. But there's so much out there and so many people online it does kind of get lost in the noise. And that's the thing. Back in the day, kind of like the Wild West, there weren't a lot of rules, but there also weren't a lot of people. Now, just about everyone is online. I have very few people aren't to some extent. And, you know, yeah, I don't do Facebook, but I do other stuff. And that's kind of, even if someone doesn't do one thing, they tend to do others. And it is kind of like Taming of the Cyber West. It is safer. Um, viruses aren't as big of a deal. They still exist, for sure. But it's more like malware and pop-ups and spyware than true viruses. Back in the day, you had to be super careful what and when you downloaded anything from. These days, well, there's still a risk. It's, uh, it's negated quite a bit. And connectivity is much easier. Back in the day, sometimes you'd just try to dial in and couldn't get on the internet that day for whatever reason, or your connection would be crap. These days, connections are a lot faster, but also more stable. And getting online is so much easier. Getting online back in the day, it was a bit of a chore. It really was. And now it's, uh, you know, easy as can be. Same thing with, like, data transfers and file compatibilities and, and all that. And, of course, now you can download several gigabyte files in just a few minutes if you have a decent connection back in the day. That would have taken about six months, maybe more. You probably didn't have a hard drive big enough to hold several gigabytes anyway. I think the first time I got a one gigabyte hard drive might have been like 1998, 1999. I remember the first time I got a one gigahertz uh, processor that was 2000. That was a big day. I do miss the older Windows. I still, Windows XP is kind of my favorite at least XP Professional. It was the most streamlined and just intuitive. And uh, if you stripped out all the crap, which Professional didn't come with near as much as home, 
yeah, it was a pretty lean, mean machine. Uh, then we get into seven, it's all right. And then 10, now they're gone, I don't know. I guess anything's better than ME. That was one of the, I don't know. Was, I think ME does get a little bit of a bad rap considering what it was, but it was pretty crap. It was just something they cranked out for Millennium. 98 was pretty good, pretty stable. 95 was pretty buggy as hell. Illegal operation. Jesus Christ, that message got old in a hurry. <sighs> oh, computers. A lot of history in there. A lot of fun working on them back in the day, too. That's something else I was talking with someone about. Back in the day, technologically speaking, your computer would get dated pretty, uh, pretty quickly. By that, I mean hardware was moving so quickly. What was a fast processor this year, next year would be average to even below average, and then in two years would be pretty dated within three or four years, just out of, out of sight. Same thing goes with RAM. You know, one time 640K was, was enough, then one megabyte was, was blistering, and then four, and then eight, and then on and on and on. And of course, Windows, really had a lot to do with that when 95 came in it really upped the memory requirements back then video cards weren't really a thing it was just uh, EGA VGA SVGA <laughs> that's about it but um, yeah keeping up hardware wise meant you had to be upgrading especially if you wanted to play the latest games or do the latest things there was these things called CD-ROMs that were the hot new thing there were also these things called floppy drives and originally three and a half was the new thing uh, before that, you had these five inches. Oh boy, <laughs> they held a blistering amount of data. I tell you, <laughs> I remember when the the zip drive came out, and having a uh, hundred megs or two hundred megs seemed like an, a lot of storage. And that that kind of went hand in hand with Napster and the MP3 thing, because you could download and fit number of songs. And by a number, I mean, you know, 20 or 30 on one of those drives if it was 100, 50 or 60 if it was a 200. But that was a lot better than that before because before we had 1.44 megabyte disks. And you could use like PK zip and PK unzip to compress a little bit, but depending on what file type, it wouldn't always be successful. But I digress. Also, computers just weren't as stable back then. You could just boot up one day and your hard drive burned out or your uh, motherboard, or your processor, or a RAM chip. I remember one day I got something new for the computer at Christmas and turned it on and it no worko. Sent it to my local radio shack, yeah, motherboard busted. So I had to replace it. It's just kind of was back then. Or sometimes you boot, but it would have weird things. You had to play with the auto exec and config sys files like that to keep it running is that you just have custom files to run certain programs if you were kind of scooting memory around because let's be honest one meg of ram was 100 or 200 dollars back then so hey if, it, if you could spend an hour tweaking a configuration file to run you were gonna do it <laughs> but that's all become much more streamlined and so much more is under the hood with computers now it was much more out in the open back in the day but um and i'm talking of course about pc i never really did macintosh i never really did uh, apple i started off with an apple II, but after that i moved to pc and that's because that's where all the the tts programs were at least the good ones text-to-speech um so yeah blind accessibility was just better on the pc of course macintosh and whatnot caught up and now it seems like they've kind of given up on their computers and mostly moved to iPhones and whatnot. I remember when the first iPads, iPods and all that came out. Who would have guessed what was essentially a nice music player, MP3 player, would evolve into the main device for humanity. <laughs> you know, one keeps on everything on their iPhones now, including the Internet and Facebook and YouTube and Hell, you're probably watching, or rather listening to this video on that right now. <sighs> so yeah, what I use the internet for these days? Yeah. Running my business, of course. Doing the two YouTube channels. But I do just like reading, and sometimes looking for funny videos. I do, I do like researching on here. 
I have very little interest in social media outside of YouTube here. Facebook, Instagram, they just don't interest me. I, I've been through that. Trolls, they don't bother me. They just don't do anything for me one way or another. I've been there, seen that. Trust me, the people from the early 90s were probably a lot crueler than anything you can dream up. Yeah, snowflake trolls. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Least threatening villain ever, the snowflake troll. But anyway, so what's your internet experience? Uh, maybe you're older than me and remember the 80s when uh, you had uh, the uh, very interesting internet, pre-internet, as it were, the DBSs and what have you. Or if you're younger, maybe you jumped in and you already had Windows and uh, high speed and yeah, maybe even YouTube already existed. Of course, kids today are growing up with YouTube, which is uh, wild. What did I grow up with? The closest thing to YouTube? Uh, CB radio. We had CBs. Yes, I'm from Arkansas. It's a thing. Look it up. But I wanted to give you a black box since it's been a, a bit. So that's what I've been up to and kind of my thought for tonight. So with that, I'm going to hit the hay. Appreciate you listening to me, hanging out. If you could, please like, share, subscribe, all that good stuff. This is Misha, and I'll catch you very soon next time.